let it go and be here now. It is my pleasure, my honor, Mother Joy, to have the opportunity tonight to present our preacher for this evening, Reverend Dr. John Dorhauer. He holds a Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy, a Master's in Divinity, and a Doctor of Ministry degree, where he studied white privilege and its effect on the church. Reverend Dorhauer is a recipient of numerous awards and accolades. Among them are Eden Seminary's Shalom Award, as well as he, he was being named, has been named as one of the religious leaders to watch by the Center for American Progress. John recently completed his term as chair of the National Council of Churches and co-chaired their United to End Racism campaign. As the face and the voice of the United Church of Christ, he is a prominent advocate for justice and embodies our denomination's vision of a just world for all. John is an author and a theologian, as well as a husband, father, a grandfather, and a huge baseball enthusiast. <laughs> but the one thing that I know personally about Dr. Dorham is that he has a profound love for the church, and he is a pastor's pastor. Despite his busy travel schedule and his speaking engagements, he makes himself available to ministers and to church folks who just want to have a cup of coffee or a Zoom call, talk about the things that they might be struggling with. And in recent weeks, my friends, with all of the challenges and the transitions taking place here in our conference, John has been very intentional about checking in with me and checking in with our staff to see how we're doing in these difficult days. And I assure you that this showing of love, support, and encouragement has been invaluable to all of us. And so it is my honor this evening to present to you our preacher for the hour, your general minister and president, the Reverend Dr. John Dorhauer. Let us receive him by saying amen. amen. Are we on? Okay. Thank you. And good uh, Abend, your Freundin von Deutschland. Sie sind immer hier willkommen. My German won't take me much further. Our reading this evening comes from Isaiah chapter 55, I'll read verses 1 through 5. Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You that have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money, without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not? and your labor for that which does not satisfy. Listen carefully to me. Eat what is good. Delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear. Come to me and listen so that you may live. And I will make with you an everlasting covenant. My steadfast, sure love for David and see, I even made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, who has glorified you. This, my friends, is the Word of God. It is true and can be trusted. So the brilliant theologian, poet, 
jazz vocalist and songwriter, Van Morrison, <laughs> in his album, Hymns to the Silence, writes a song out of the depression that would prompt the authoring of that album. And the name of that song is entitled, Not Feeling It Anymore. And in it, he confesses that the music that runs through his soul, and like Jeremiah, who tried to keep the word within him and he couldn't because it became like a burning coal, that music would just pour out from Ben Morris until it did. And for one whose life's mission and gift to the world was this music that ran through his soul, the absence of it became painful, too painful. And whether the absence fueled the depression or the depression fueled and exacerbated the absence, who knows? And he would come to speak of this time in his life as his silence. The music had dried up. And in the song, Not Feel It Anymore, he rehearses in each of the verses everything he tried to escape from the silence. That only made it worse. There was the drugs and the alcohol and the fame and the money and the riches and all of the notoriety and none of that brought the music back. None of that brought the music back. He still endured in the silence. And what I think he realized, and what I want to talk about tonight, and I'm putting my language now onto his to fit the theme of the evening release, <laughs> is that there's a difference between escape and release. And so much of what we do when, for him it was the silence, but for whatever it is that eats away at our joy, so much of what we do is an attempt to escape with the pain of it all, the anguish of it all. And he named a few things that he did, but we all have our own remedies of escape. And escape is born not of trust in the one who has the power to free and to liberate and to release, but from the fear that there is nothing there. And the reliance on bread that does not satisfy, labor that cannot fulfill. Towards the end of that song, not feeling it anymore, having recognized that escape was fruitless, he instead turned and faced the silence and wrote his hymns to the silence. That's what the album is. And at the end of that song, not feeling it anymore, comes this line. Got to get back to base. I've got to go back and rediscover how it was my life became grounded in the first place. And instead of escaping everything that feeds my depression, I will find my base and release myself from the confinement that the silence conveys. I want to note that of the hymns that would follow his effort to get back to base, the fifth song on that album, sung in his beautiful Irish looking tenor voice, is Be Thou My Vision. It's as if to say, when I lose my own power to see beyond the pain in front of me, when I lose my own ability to imagine a pathway forward, you Creator must become my vision. Be thou my vision. Got to get back to base. Not 
feeling. I would imagine over the last months, year, two and a half years, for me, since November of 2016, there have been days of not feeling anymore. I would imagine for all of us this is the case. And the call to us as consumers in a world enamored with all of the baubles that money can buy, the temptation is for us to spend our money on that which does not satisfy and our labor on that which does not feed. It is a method of escaping what we are experiencing rather than allowing ourselves through the power and the spirit of the risen Christ and our Creator to be released and liberated and delivered. And I would invite you in the quiet moments that you have in this beautiful space that we are in to rehearse for yourself what some of those things might have been over the last few years that ushered in your silence that brought you to a place where you're not feeling it anymore. Now this is a gathering where we invite the presence the risen Christ and the living God to touch us in ways to become now our vision so that we can see beyond that. Paul writes that hope is the assurance of things not seen. You bow my vision, right? And in those moments of deep and dark despair when you're not feeling it, where the silence is profound, and the temptation simply to escape is very real. In those moments, we as people of faith must look for, with the eyes that God can provide, the hope that our eyes often fail to see. A funny thing happens, I began preparing for this moment this evening. Um, I, I love words. I absolutely love words and their meanings. And I want to go back and discover how a word became a word and how its usage over time came to indicate to us that when you say this word, this is what you're communicating and this is what you want others to hear. When I graduated from college, my mom said, I will buy you anything you want. I would be the first of my generation to do that, and she was very proud. And I said, I want a copy of the Oxford English Dictionary. <laughs> and by golly, she bought it for me. And so preparing for this, I went out of curiosity and looked up in my Oxford English Dictionary the word release. And something surprised me. I want to read to you. Yeah, I'm going to have to do it from memory. I don't have a memory. Release is the deliverance or liberation from pain, sorrow, trouble, or its life. And when I read that, the first thing that struck me is how closely related release is to liberation. Liberation, a clear and consistent biblical theme. And once that connection was made, these passages and images from Scripture kept flooding over me. Right? Exodus, chapter 3. And if we're talking about confinement, and if we're talking about entrapment, and if we're talking about being in a situation that deprives you of joy, we're talking about the enslavement of the people of Israel when the book of Exodus opens up. And in that third chapter, something is about to be done about that entrapment, that enslavement, that condition of being nobody in the world, of crying out 
and nobody caring, nobody hearing. And when hearing, nobody willing to do anything about it. And in that context, in that third chapter, God speaks to Moses and says, I have seen the suffering of my people, my people. I have heard their cries. I know their suffering. And the Hebrew knows it, I'm not cognizant of it. It's, I am by and I have come down to set them free. And from that moment on through the book of Exodus, the cry is, let my people go. Our relationship with this creator, our covenant with this God, is a relationship and a covenant that not only has the capacity to hear, to see, to know, come down, but to liberate, to release, to set free. And we know this, and yet oftentimes our methods and strategy for dealing with the silence, the depression, the discomfort, the pain, is to escape. Rather than with the eyes of hope, eyes that on their own cannot see, as God would say to Moses at the crossing of the Red Sea, to simply stand still and let God liberate you. When we get to Luke, echoing, embodying, incarnating the presence of this liberating God, Jesus, in the fourth chapter of Luke, standing in the synagogue of his hometown, opens up the scroll to the book of Isaiah and reads, This is the year of the Lord's favor. God has sent me here to preach good news to the poor and to set the captives free. <coughs> That's what God and the risen Christ are not only willing to do, they are capable of doing that. I have come to set the captive free. <laughs> Scripture closes with the book of Revelation. Towards the end of that book, specifically chapter 21, we hear about a new heaven and a new earth where the former things are no more, where God wipes away every tear, and there will be no more crime, no more death, no more pain, and no more sorrow. All of those things from which we seek release, from which we will settle for escape, God is promising. And because of that, Paul writes in Romans, I consider that our present suffering, let's pause there, because this call to release is all about our present suffering. And it is palpable, and it is tangible, and it is powerful, and it is all-consuming. It's waking up morning after morning after morning and learning about one more mass shooting. It's waking up and realizing that after decades of hard-won civil and human rights, we're about to see over the next decade of our lives every one of them rolled back by a Supreme Court willing to undo everything that we have fought so hard for. It's about enduring as a global community a pandemic that has seen loved ones disappear suffer in hospital rooms, dying without any of their family being able to even come in and say goodbye to them. The collective grief of this will be felt for generations. So all of this is real. And into that, one who knew the sorrow and the suffering and the pain and the toil and tribulation of life wrote, I believe that our present son real though it may be, is not worth comparing to the glory that in time will be revealed in us. As followers of the risen Christ, as 
children of the Creator of life. We hope with eyes that may not see, but hearts that fully believe and trust that this God, this liberating, freeing, releasing God will bring us to a new day when the former things have passed away and there is no more tears, no more crying, no more death, no more. So when we're not feeling it anymore and when the call and the temptation to find the easy way to escape is so present and so powerful and so real. Let us ourselves believe that our present suffering is not worth comparing to the glory that the time will be revealed in us. Let us ask God to be thou our vision so that we can see with new eyes what God intends for us. Let us get back to our base. And let us feel the promise and the hope and the power of the God who has not only promised that liberation and that deliverance and that release, but who has never failed to fulfill the promise made. And what God has done once and again and again, God will do it forever. And so tonight, we remind ourselves as we reunite its family in the presence of all of the suffering that is so powerful and so real, we remind ourselves that God and God's Spirit releases it and releases us from all. Be now.